Welcome to worship on this first day of Lent in February of 2024. We begin with a call to worship. It is by grace that we are who we are, people who are called by Jesus, yet fearful to follow. It is by God's grace that we can become followers, people who are fearful, yet gifted with courage beyond wonder. It is with God's grace that we become who we might be, people who step out in faith, sharing the good news generously. As we come into this time of worship, I invite you to sing, Take Up Your Cross, the Savior said. As we worship, we attune our hearts to God's presence and the invitation of God to come and worship. Let us pray. Holy God, by your grace, you touch our fears with the fire of your compassion. You touch our brokenness with the fire of your forgiveness. You touch our hearts with the fire of your love. Jesus Christ, by your grace, you step into our lives and an unpredictable journey begins. You challenge us to new thinking, which overflow with overflowing result, results. You so confront our doubts that we can cast away our fears. Holy Spirit, by your grace, you give us eyes to see the emptiness of the world. You give us ears to hear the cries of the hungry. You give, give us gifts to bring hope and healing to all. God and community, holy and one, by your grace, we are who we are, your children, your people, your church, through Christ. Amen. It is so simple to say, yet so difficult to live out. Do not be afraid. Yet whatever fears burden us, God will lift from our souls. Whatever foolishness we have uttered, God whispers mercy to us. Whatever wrong we have done, God's forgiveness is poured out upon us. I invite you to join with me as we pray to the one whose love is constant in every moment, in every place of our lives. A prayer of confession. God of wonder and joy, we look in the mirror and do not see holiness reflected back. We long to be sisters and brothers with others, but don't want to be an intrusion in our friends' lives. 
We yearn to be more compassionate, yet it is often spite and malice we offer to someone else. We are so busy listening to those internal recordings that we have trouble hearing the cries of loneliness coming from those around us. Forgive us, God, who longs to be enthroned in our hearts. You call us to be two different lives so we might make a difference for all who hurt. You invite us into your kingdom so we might show the others the way. You challenge us to take a risk by following Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, so we might become your children once again. An assurance of pardon. The one who alone is holy became wholly human, so we might see the face of grace. The one who is seated in the heavens endured the cross, so we might see the face of salvation. This is our good news. We are forgiven. By God's grace, with God's grace, we are who we are meant to be, forgiven, restored, called people. Thanks be to God. Amen. We turn now to our focus for the service, a reading from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. The reading for today is Luke 5, verse 1 through 10. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let your nets for let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The one thing I am not is a fisherman. I have almost no understanding of what is necessary to catch one fish, let alone a great haul of fish. I have carried a fishing rod, but I've never used one. So the story of Peter is likely one that I have the least understanding about when it comes to the location and circumstances. However, I do get some things. No one wants their work to be unproductive. A fisherman is out to catch a fish. A teacher wants to teach. A doctor, nurse, or PSW is, desires to bring health to the body and mind of those in their care. A minister desires that those with whom they spend time would be strengthened in their spirit. A tradesperson, artist, crafter, musician, or dancer wants to create something that is meaningful. Well, at least that is what one hopes for. There are so many people who do not find meaning and purpose in their lives that, is, that it, it is truly distressing. It, be, it becomes increasingly difficult as we age, and what defined us in our working lives is no longer. Then our physical ability to move and be helpful to others or even be able to be physically present in the community becomes limited. It can be frustrating, to say the least. So maybe we can relate to Peter and the other disciples in this story as they have worked all night to no avail. No fish. No income. Just a long night of disappointment. They are busy cleaning up their nets when Jesus decides to commandeer Simon's boat and teach crowds from that vantage point. Jesus needs a little space. Then, after a while, Jesus tells Simon Peter to let down the net again, so he shoves out the boat a little and does so. Having said that, of course, Peter explains that there's little possibility of anything happening as they've already worked all night. But rather than argue the point, Peter gives in and sets the nets. We're told what happens next. 
the great catch of fish, so big that it nearly busts the nets and sinks the boats, and every available hand is needed to get the catch in. Now, this is a miracle story, but what happens next is something to take note of. Peter's response is not, wow, thank you, that is amazing, but rather, Peter fell down at Jesus' knees saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Not one something that one might have expected to hear in the moment, but then again, Peter may have just realized that he is truly in the presence of someone with power, power over people and power over nature itself. This is not the first time Peter has watched Jesus in action. He has already hosted Jesus in his home and watched as his mother-in-law was healed from a high fever. Not only that, others who were sick were brought there to be healed that night. For some reason, this encounter, this one at the shore and on the boat, has really hit at Peter's core. His response to witnessing Jesus at work on this day is, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. You might think that Jesus would say something like, oh, your sin is forgiven. But nope, he instead says, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. Peter recognized his own inadequacy when faced with the power of God and thought it best to let Jesus know that he should just leave rather than bother with someone like Peter. But Jesus saw the value in this humble fisherman. You see, though the pictures in our children's Bibles and stories always had the fishermen looking clean with nice robes, on top of that looking rather Romanesque, that is far what, what, from what would have been. Think dirty after a long night's work. Possibly a little or a lot stinky because of working with fish and fish nets and also being poor. They were poor people. Fishermen were low on the rungs of society's ladder. They made little money and shared their catch with those in power. These are the men, Peter and James and John, whom Jesus called to go with him. Later, he gets Matthew, a tax collector, on board as well. These are not people with power or prestige or influence. They are about as ordinary as you can get. Peter in particular was aware of his inadequacy and it scared him. Jesus scared him. Peter felt unworthy of what Jesus had done with providing the catch of fish. He may have coupled this moment with the healing he had witnessed in his own home days before. Whatever was going on, Peter did not feel capable, worthy, or worthy to be in Jesus' presence or to have Jesus' presence in his life. Peter, those fishing with him, and all those present that had followed Jesus as he taught witnessed all that was going on. They heard the conversation, watched the catch happen, and all were amazed, but it also made them afraid. It was too much. Too much power, too much presence, just too much. And so Peter cowered in front of such power. The difference is that the power of Jesus is love, care, compassion, and an invitation to be part of what God is up to in the world. Peter was only used to power that was corrupt, harmful, and controlling, and he didn't know what to do with this kind of power. Many times we feel inadequate, and so stop short of doing what we may feel called to do. We don't feel we have the right gifts. We can't find the right words. We don't have enough, to, enough pull. It can also be that we might feel that we are being asked to give up something that we would rather not give up. It is not likely that God is asking you or I to give up our homes or our job or even our retirement though it may be for some. It is more likely that our fear is that God will ask us to give up control and let God take the lead in our lives. 
It may be our fear of inadequacy. We just don't feel like we are enough. That we have, that we don't have anything of value to offer to another or to God. It may be our fear that God will ask too much of us. We may have many excuses for asking job God to just leave. Thank you very much. One might choose to come to church and participate in worship. Might even volunteer because, well, at least here, everyone thinks about God and it is safe. But ask us to leave this building or your home and carry our faith out into the world, even risking that God would value us enough to be invited into God's work into the world, while that becomes terrifying. Could one be, I wonder, curious about God in their lives? Curious about how God values you, even when you've you, even with your fear, your inadequacies, with all that you are. And God says, I invite you to be a part of what I am up to in the world. Trust me, Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit know what they're working with. And they desire that you be a part of the work anyway. It is through us ordinary people with all of our flaws, challenges, struggles, and sin that God's extraordinary love finds its way into the world. God is asking you and me to go with God, saying, do not be afraid. Follow Jesus. And you will be part of something greater than yourself. Jesus will make something of you in the work that he has in the world. That will be valued. You are valued enough. You are God's creation that Jesus wants to have as part of the invitation and part of the work in the world. You are called in Christ, with Christ, and through Christ. Amen. With all that we ponder about these words, whether the scripture or the message or hymn or prayer, we continue in the prayers of the people. Let us pray. As we enter this holy season, Lord God, We give you thanks for your promise of new life that sustains us, encouraging us when news is difficult. We thank you for tiny signs of hope, even in a bleak landscape or on or a challenging day, for glimpses of beauty in a smile or a ray of sunshine, for the people who support others in times of difficulty, for the chance to recover from mistakes, to begin again. Lord of life, sustain us with your presence and give us patience and perseverance as we await the future with you. Trusting your promise of new life, it is with hope that we pray for anyone we have hurt by harsh words or careless deeds, for those known to us who are carrying heavy burdens, for those we work with, for all who are seeking employment or worry about their businesses. For troubled places in our world and those who work for reconciliation and understanding. For churches seeking new ways to minister in changing times. For all those on our hearts this day. Renew our hope for the future you will bring us and our desire to live out the courage and compassion of Christ our Lord as we pray together the words he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. 
in letting go of the gifts we offer, in releasing them to God or for God's use through the church, we let go of any attempts or inclinations to control God's activity in our lives and pray for the reign of in our midst of God's free and graceful spirit. Should you wish to support this ministry here at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, I'd invite you to take a look at our website, standrewspres-tbay.ca. There you can find ways to help out uh, through your donations and learn more about us. As we close this time, we think of that following and that invitation from Christ with the hymn, Will You Come and Follow Me? Live in God's presence, exult in life's promise, claim the gifts that are ours each day, serve gladly knowing that you have much to offer, and so find the joy of Christ. Amen.